भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षभ स्थिरंगुष्टवागुंशस्तनु व्यषेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति न स्ताक्षो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओं शाति 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 ओं O oh gods may we hear auspicious words with ears while engaged in sacrifices may we see auspicious things with the eyes while praising the gods with steady limbs may we enjoy a life that is beneficial to the gods may indra of ancient fame be auspicious to us may the all knowing pusha god of the earth be propitious to us may garuda the destroyer of evil be well disposed towards us may brihas may brihaspati ensure our welfare om peace 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 so we are studying the mundaka upanishad let me chant the mantras which we have just covered om brahma deva nam pratamasam bhuva विश्वस्य कर्ता भुवनस्य गोप्ता स ब्रह्म विद्यादर्वाय ज्येष्ठपुत्रा प्राह ओम ब्रह्मा वॉज द क्रिएटर ऑफ द यूनिवर्स द प्रोटेक्टर ऑफ द यूनिवर्स वॉज द फर्स्ट ऑफ द गॉड्स टू बी मैनिफेस्टेड टू हिज एल्डेस्ट सन अथर्वा ही इम्पॉर्टेड द नॉलेज ऑफ ब्राह्मण दैट इज द बेसिस ऑफ ऑल नॉलेज देन वॉट हैपन अथर्वणेया प्रवदेत ब्रह्म अथर्वाता पुरोवाचांगिरे ब्रह्म विद्या स भारद्वाजा सत्यवहाय प्राह भारद्वाजो अंगिसे परावरा द नॉलेज ऑफ ब्रह्म ब्रह्म दट ब्रह्म इम्पार्टेड टू अथर्वा अथर्वा ट्रांसमिटेड टू अंगीर इन डेज ऑफ योर हि अंगीर passed it on to satyavaha of the line of bharadwaja he of the line of bharadwaja handed it down to angiras this knowledge that had been received in succession from the higher from the higher by the lord ones so it's a lineage of transmission of knowledge from teachers to student and by showing its extreme antiquity so here is the upanishads which goes back millennia and there they're talking about an ancient knowledge handed down since time immemorial so the idea is to give a prestige to a knowledge that it's very important it's been come it's coming come down from god himself through a line of teachers and notice the teachers are as far as we can see so far they are all householders they are all married people with children and they are being transmitted from father to son and then the monastic uh, lineage came in a little later you know with, with you know um monks like shankaracharya his teacher govinda father his teacher gauda father that came later but we can see a clearly a lineage of uh, householders who were fully enlightened and great masters of vedanta who transmitted this down through teacher and student establishes the uh, prestige and antiquity of the knowledge the importance of learning it from a teacher so the and the transmission down a lineage of teachers so that is being emphasized here um then next what happened shaunako havai mahashalo angirasam vidivad upasanna papracha kasminno bhagavo vigyate sarvam idam vigyatam bhavati iti now we have the disciple who comes to in the same lineage the disciple shaunaka who is now clearly mentioned as a um, a very successful man of the world was a great householder a great in the sense it's it's mentioned that he had uh, extensive um, uh, sacrificial fire altars which means first he was ritualistic very pious in the vedic sense he was rich enough to afford all that stuff and he was a householder he was married um so a man of the world very successful a good man devout man now he wants something more something deeper 
the mystery of the universe. What's going on here? What is this world? What am I? What is the ultimate knowledge? So he comes to the teacher Angiras, who was the last in the lineage we have seen so far. And Vidivat, I mentioned, you approach in a traditional way, with respect, and there's a way to approach a teacher. And says, oh, adorable sir, what is that thing which having been known, all this becomes known? So what's the one thing? If I know that, I know everything. Now what's going on here? I explained last time, I'm not going to. Um, dwell on it too much now. What's this question? Knowing one thing, one knows everything. So the idea behind it is, if you know the cause, you know the effects. What does that mean? So there, there is, like, for example, gold, and out of which one can make a variety of golden ornaments. So instead of trying to know each of those golden ornaments separately, if you know it's gold, you recognize it's gold. Then you know the reality of all those golden ornaments. Um, similarly, water and waves and you know, um, iron and iron implements. I'm using these Upanishadic examples. Basically, the idea of a material cause, um, a substance, a reality, out of which everything else is made. And if you know that, then you know uh, everything. But you know everything only in a special sense, in, in the sense that what it is really. Um, you, don't, you may not know it in details. So there's a nice story about this, <clears throat> that by knowing the cause, you know everything. The story, it's popular among children in India. I think we have, most of us here would have heard it or some version of it. So the great Lord Mahadeva Shiva and uh, uh, the Divine Mother Parvati, they are in their abode in the Mount Kailasa. And their children, the, the, the two boys, uh, Kartikeya, the Lord of War, and Ganesha. So they're playing. And uh, the story goes, maybe they were being uh, mischievous or bugging their mother. So anyway, the upshot is the Divine Mother, Parvati, calls the two boys and says, uh, says that, how about a competition? The one who goes around the universe three times, it's a race. So off you go. One who goes around the universe three times first will get a prize. In some stories, the prize is a mango. In some stories, the prize is a necklace, neither of which would really um, uh, motivate kids today. But anyway, we're talking about millennia ago or whatever. So whatever it is, there's a prize and it's a race. And uh, you have to, the race is three times around the universe. Off you go, boys. Now it's a patently unfair race because Kartika is the lord of war and he is uh, absolutely fit. You know, he's like some special forces guy. And, and not only that, all of them have their own mounts. Um, Shiva has his bull. The mother um, has the lion, Durga. And uh, Kartika has the peacock. So it's colorful, brilliant, uh, you know, it's a little show off -y. And uh, Ganesha has, uh, poor Ganesha has only a mouse. So uh, there also Kartika has an advantage. He's fit as a fiddle and he's got um, uh, the bird which can fly around. Not that the peacock does fly too well and certainly not an, around the universe, but doesn't matter. It's still better than a mouse. And Ganesha, to top it all, is not at all fit. You, if you see Ganesha, he's got this huge elephant head and also a pot belly. So it's patently unfair. But anyhow, Kartika is supremely confident of winning the race and he jumps on his um, peacock and he says, bye, and he's off to go around the universe. Ganesha hasn't even stirred. After some time, the Divine Mother says to him, well, my dear, aren't you going to try? I mean, aren't you even going to try? See, I was just thinking, today if kids bother their mother, they'll probably get an iPad or something, you know, just to keep them engaged. So in those days, no iPads, so the mother gave them that race around the universe. Aren't you even going to try? Um, so finally, Ganesha stirred himself lazily and he got up. And with folded hands, he went around his father and mother, Shiva and Shakti, Shiva and Parvati, three times he went around. And he said, thus, I have gone around the universe. Thou art the, the source, the reality of this universe. Everything in this universe is nothing but you. 
you in various names and forms, you are this entire universe. And so I have gone around the universe. By the time, so Kartika came much later, huffing and puffing and tired and flushed with obvious victory. And he still sees Ganesha still relaxing on his couch or whatever. But uh, he was stunned to hear that Ganesha has won the ra race long ago. So that, but the story is that if you know the cause, the source, that reality out of which the entire universe is made, you know the universe. Uh, you know what it is really. And in Advaita Vedanta, it becomes even more clear. Because whatever the varieties that you see in the universe, they are like a magic show. They are like a display, like a dream, like a, like a mirage in the... Um, you know, mirage in the, in the desert. It's a display without any reality to them. If you know the underlying reality, that um, it is, um, it is the rope alone which appeared as the snake, or somebody saw it as a garland, somebody saw it as a crack in the earth, um, alluding to the classical Sanskrit example, or it is um, um, the same sky, colorless sky, which sometimes appeared to be blue, sometimes to be red and whatnot, then you know the reality. Because those appearances are just appearances. Even the details in which they differ are not significant because they are appearances. They have no substantial reality of their own. So, um, you know the source. The rea underlying source for the universe is Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss. Whatever you experience in the universe whatever can be experienced in the universe is nothing but Brahman. Um, so that was the question. That what is that? So obviously the answer would be if you know Brahman, you know everything. Because uh, whatever you know separately through physics and chemistry and mathematics is like Kartika going around the universe and trying to know it in piecemeal, in detail. You know, reading the books on every subject. You know every bit of it uh, in detail. But if you uh, see the, um, the source of it, the underlying reality, you're like Ganesha. You have seen that which appears as the entire universe. Now the teacher, Angiras, said to the student, Tasme saho vacha dve vidye veditabye itihasmayad brahma vido vadanti Parajaiva paraja. To him, this is the fourth mantra. To him, that means to the student Shaunaka. He said, he meaning the teacher, Angiras. There are two kinds of knowledge to be acquired, the higher and the lower. Para and apara. Para means higher, apara means lower. That is what, as the tradition run, runs, the knowers of, of the import of the Vedas say. So here also the teacher is... Um, repeating the importance of the line of transmission. I didn't invent this. This is knowledge that I have received from ancient masters. Brahmavida, knowers of Brahman. There are two meanings of that. One is, of course, those who are enlightened or just those who are experts in the Veda, in the Vedic knowledge. They have told us that knowledge is of two kinds, higher and lower, the transcendent and the relative, um, para and apara. Um, what he is doing here, he is flagging something that you have asked a question. Instead of directly answering it, first you need to know that yes, there is something by knowing which you know everything. And the knowledge of that by knowing which you know everything is not like other knowledge. There are actually two kinds of knowledge. One kind of knowledge is the knowledge of everything, like the Kartika kind of knowledge. When you go and know everything in detail, you see, smell, hear, taste, touch, read about it, do research, learn about little things in, in depth. That's one kind of knowledge. And there's this other special kind of knowledge, which is the knowledge of God, of Brahman, of the ultimate reality, enlightenment, which is uh, in Vedanta called Brahma Vidya or Brahma Jnana, the realization of Brahman. You know the reality of everything, the Ganesha kind of knowledge. So, and also, the results are different. The results of the lower knowledge, aparavidya, the Kartika kind of knowledge, the knowledge of the effects, the knowledge of the appearances, the result of that is also limited. So if you know a particular branch of knowledge, you get a PhD in that, you know some amount of things about the universe, but not everything. 
and not that and it'll never solve all of your problems a little bit maybe sometimes it might help but if you know the knowledge of the cause in sanskrit karana if you know the knowledge what the, you know the, the ganesha kind of knowledge then the results are limitless because wherever you are whatever you are doing in whatever condition you are you have this available to you always brahman is everywhere and everything just as wherever you are in the ocean you, there is water the, whatever golden ornament you are putting on it's gold you know you know its reality similarly whatever you come across in life whomever you come across in life whatever situation you are in life it's brahman and you are that reality and that gives limitless result it takes you beyond sorrow it solves all our problems uh, it makes you infinite basically because you are that reality um now so here he has just made a distinction before i answer your question the teacher says you ask me what is that knowledge by knowing which everything is known well there is this knowledge but remember it's not like the other kind of knowledge then so he, he makes a division between paravidya and aparavidya the high, higher knowledge paravidya and the lower knowledge aparavidya and now he's going to tell us naturally our question is so what is this lower knowledge and what is this higher knowledge now tell us about it he's going to tell us now mantra number 5 ൈറ്റ് what 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 was just said the lower knowledge is it comprises the rigveda the yajurveda the samaveda the atharva veda the science of pronunciation the code of rituals grammar etymology meter and astrology basically everything right? here is just because in the vedic context it mentioned everything in the vedic context yes yeah, so all kinds of knowledge which was there today they would hand you the entire syllabus of the university that's the lower knowledge everything both religious and secular whatever we know about the world about ourselves you know the physics chemistry biology physiology um, uh, neuroscience psychology engineering language grammar poetry the humanities all of all of it music art all of it is low knowledge and then he says then there is the higher knowledge by which is attained that imperishable the word used is akshara akshara means imperishable what is he saying you asked for that knowing which everything is known and um uh, i am you know that by knowing which everything is known is the imperishable akshara so the the knowledge by which you know the imperishable akshara is uh, the higher knowledge paravidya and that's basically what you are asking for imperishable here is another word for brahman the cause knowledge so basically what is he saying the first is the list of and the effect knowledge you know you want to know you want to have a catalog of all the ornaments in the, in the jewelry shop so the the catalog gives you the lower knowledge all the varieties of ornaments which are available and there's a higher knowledge which tells you though all of them are gold or silver whatever that's the higher knowledge one is the, is the knowledge of the effects the lower knowledge and one is the knowledge of the cause the reality of all these effects that's the higher knowledge paravidya all right then let's go into this so the vedic knowledge was divided into four sets of the vedic texts the rigveda yajurveda samaveda atharva veda the rigveda is this collection of the most ancient uh, hymns and they are in poetic form so in poetic uh, in meter in, in poetic form um then there is the yajurveda which is in prose form all the texts there the, the uh, vedic mantras are in prose form and then there is the samaveda which is basically the rigveda mantras but they're set to music not our modern kind of music 
uh, Vedic chanting, what is called Samagana. It's a kind, um, you can find it on YouTube. It's probably the basis of um, a lot of classical Indian music, but very ancient, very primeval. It's, it's singing, it's a kind of singing. And then um, there is the Atharva Veda. So these are the four Vedas, the, the foundational texts of uh, Hinduism. Uh, most of these Vedas, the bulk of them, deal with rituals, karma, um, various kinds of uh, rituals. We just, when we started this, we did a peace chant uh, praising the Vedic gods. So these rituals were offerings to these Vedic gods who would give us what we want. What did we want in this life? Uh, we wanted health, we wanted, uh, you know, wealth and success and, you know, rainfall, let there be a lot of crops and let the uh, livestock, the cows be healthy, uh, let our children be safe. And after death, or if you're a king, you wanted to conquer other kingdoms, all of that would be granted by the Vedic gods if you did the rituals properly. And then after death, the pious Vedic person might want to go to one of the many available Vedic um, the, the heavens which were promised by the Vedas. All of these were possible if you did the rituals correctly. The Shonaka, for example, is mentioned as a person who did these rituals very seriously, took them very seriously. So anyway, uh, those rituals are now mostly replaced. They're still there. Nothing dies in Hinduism. So in a smaller attenuated form, they're still there. But uh, um, they're mostly replaced these days by the puja, the worship of the deities which you find in uh, temples and in homes. Um, then there is a, in these um, Vedas, you will find karma and certain kinds of visualization practices which, are, which today we translate as meditation, but they're not quite like the meditations that we do today. They're called vidya, karma, Vidya or Upasana. And then you will find texts like Upanishads. These, for example, the Mundak Upanishad. They're also part of the Vedas. Where Vedanta is taught, the final highest teachings about who we are, what this universe is, what is the mystery of this, and how do we attain fulfillment. Not partial, not, not you know, rainfall and cattle and um, going to heaven after death. No. We transcend this limitation and become free of this cycle of birth and death. So the Upanishads are there. Now, all of these he names, and then he goes on. There are other associated sciences which helped the Vedic um, people to understand and use the Vedas. So what were these sciences? Shiksha. For uh, modern Indians, most Indian languages, Shiksha would mean education. But in the, in the Vedic context, it meant pronunciation. The science of chanting the Vedas properly with correct pronunciation. And there are books about these. Pronunciation was very important. So um, Sanskrit, in fact, is a language which is designed for precise pronunciation. It's written exactly the way it is pronounced. It's very scientific that way. And the Vedic, they, they took it to another level altogether. These mantras had to be chanted with perfect pronunciation and intonation, the highs and the lows. Um, then only it's the proper chanting of the Vedic mantras along with the associated rituals which would produce the desired effect. You know, whether you wanted rainfall or victory over enemies or going to heaven or whatever it is. If you didn't chant it properly, then the results would not come. Sometimes there would be harm. A, a well-known story which we read as kids uh, was the gods and the demons were at war as usual. And then finally, the demons, the asuras, they decided um, they're going to, you know, develop this super demon and like a special weapon kind of thing, uh, which will, who will destroy the king of the gods, Indra. We just chanted, um, you know, prayers to Indra, Indra of ancient fame, maybe, may he be propitious to us. So the king of the gods will be destroyed by this uh, super demon we are going to create. And for that, they, they had an elaborate ritual, a Vedic ritual. And a great sage who has his own backstory. In, in these, you know, there are stories and backstories and backstories to backstories. I'm not going to go into that. So this great Vedic sage, he had his reasons for taking revenge on Indra. So when he was invited um, to set up 
this ritual and produce a super demon. Uh, uh, so uh, he agreed. And the gods were terrified because they're going to be defeated by this terrible creature going to be produced by the demon. So they went to Vishnu, who is always ready to help the gods in their uh, eternal fight against the demons. So it's all basically symbolic. But anyway, so Vishnu arranged that when the mantras were being chanted, um, Saraswati would go on the, uh, the tongue of the sage who was chanting the mantras and make him mispronounce the mantras. So the effect would not be quite what he thought it would be. You know, and today it would be called hacking. So, <laughs> so you're messing with the computer systems or something. So when the sage, sage was chanting, the um, purpose of the whole ritual was May the destroyer of Indra arise or grow. Indra Shatrun Vardhaswa. Indra Shatru Vardhaswa. Let the, the destroyer of Indra arise. But depending on the intonation, the word Indra Shatru, uh, the, uh, the one who is inimical to Indra, it could mean either the Sanskrit grammar can it can mean both, it can go both ways, it can cut both ways. The destroyer of Indra, the one whom Indra destroys. So when he was chanting, he made this little tiny mistake. He didn't notice it. So the great demon was born, Vritra Asura. We have read these stories as kids in India. <laughs> so we had a comic book of how terrifying he was. And then uh, he went around fighting. The demons won all the battles and defeated the gods. And the gods were routed again and again. And so how do you defeat this terrible uh, demon? And then they go to the sage Dadhiji, who was a very austere, very, you know, who had done a lot of spiritual practices, a very austere sage. And um, he said, what do you want? And the gods said to him that we want your, we want your bones, you know, out of your bones we shall fashion because you have always spoken the truth and led a very pious and a very austere life all your life. Your very bones are holy, uh, are holy. So with those bones, we shall fashion uh, a thunderbolt of such great power that it will destroy Vritra Asura. And so that was how, and the sage, of course, he's not attached to his body. He happily gave up his body for the great cause. And out of his bones of the, of the great sage was fashioned Indra's weapon. Indra's weapon is called the Vajra, the thunderbolt. So the thunderbolt Indra uses to destroy Vritra Asura. Colorful story. The point is, be careful of your pronunciation. <laughs> he wanted Vritrasura to destroy Indra. But what happened was Indra ended up destroying Vritrasura because of the wrong pronunciation. So anyway, whole point is, Shiksha, the science of Vedic pronunciation, is extremely important to produce the desired result. Um, what else uh, is there? Shiksha, Kalpa. So Kalpa is another set of texts which tell us how to use the Vedic um, mantras as part of Vedic rituals. So if you just see the Vedic texts, there are mantras scattered all over and you wouldn't know what they mean or how are you going to use them in what ritual. But the priests know how to do it and the priests are told what to do with these mantras by these texts called Kalpa. And then there are multiple such Kalpa Sutras are there. Shiksha Kalpa Vyakaranam Niruktam so Grammar. Next is grammar, which is big. Um, one needs to use language properly. And, um, and of course, Sanskrit grammar is well known. Panini's grammar, for example. I've told this story, but today seems to be story time. So I'll tell you this story also. Uh, another colorful story. So grammar. You wouldn't know the grammar has exciting stories. In the backstory for grammar. So... Um, Vishnu, you know, the Lord Vishnu, he reclines on his, his couch, the cosmic serpent, uh, Sheshanaga, who has a thousand heads. And like Vishnu, who takes incarnations, Sheshanaga um, also, the cosmic serpent, takes incarnations. And his famous incarnation is as the great sage um, Patanjali. And Patanjali is the one who came down to humanity and gave us Three systems. Uh, one is for the body, Ayurveda. So the system of Ayurvedic medicine and Patanjali is regarded as the sage of that system who gave us a system of medicine for curing uh, illness in the body. Then uh, medicine for the speech, for curing incorrect speech. 
So Patanjali's great commentaries on Panini's grammar. So Panini wrote the sutras for grammar. In Sanskrit, there are sutras in Sanskrit knowledge systems. They are codified into sutras. In Vedanta, there is the Vedanta Sutra, Brahma Sutra. In Yoga, there is the Yoga Sutra. In grammar, there is Panini Sutra. But what to do make sense of the sutras, you need a commentary. And the commentary was written by uh, Patanjali, the great sage, who was none other than the great serpent, um, Seshanaga. And then there is, uh, he also gave us the medicine for the mind, the Yoga Sutras. So Yoga Sutras the, for the mind and the Sanskrit grammar commentary for the speech and then um, Ayurveda for the body. And the grammar story, I have, many of you know it because I've told you earlier, but I love this story. The grammar story goes like this, that um, the great sage Patanjali was teaching grammar and uh, he had a thousand students and they would all assemble in a great hall and study grammar with him. Uh, but there was a rule. Uh, Patanjali said, the master said that when I teach, a curtain will fall on the stage and I will teach from behind the cur curtain. Until the class is over, you know, you know, until I go shanti, 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 don't raise the curtain, don't look behind the curtain. Um, so the class went and the class went wonderfully. Each of the students was delighted. It was like he was speaking to me. Uh, to each felt you're speaking to me. You see the symbol, symbolism of it. A thousand people and the Patanjali is none other than the cosmic serpent who's supposed to have a thousand heads and so on. Now, of course, students are mischievous. So the students can't contain their curiosity. What's going on? What's the old man doing behind the curtain? So one student, one day, he crept up to the, the curtain while the class was going on and he lifted one corner of the uh, of the curtain and uh, looked inside, peeped inside just a little bit. And he was stunned to see there is no stage behind it and no Patanjali. It's the cosmos, the entire cosmos. And covering the entire cosmos is this, uh, this terrifying uh, gigantic serpent with a thousand heads with flame pouring out of each of those thousand mouths, the Sheshanaga, the the cosmic bed of Vishnu. He saw that and he fainted. But it was too late. The curtain fell back in place. It was too late because he had raised the curtain a little bit. Uh, and from that escaped a little bit of that cosmic fire coming from the thousand mouths of uh, Sheshanaga. Just a little spark. But that was enough to reduce the thousand students to ashes. And uh, Patanjali resumed his human form and raised the curtain and he jumped out shouting, Alas, alas. In Sanskrit, ha ha kar karte hue. Uh, you know, so he, alas, not because the thousand students had been reduced to ashes, but because what would happen to grammar? There's nobody to learn grammar now. They're all dead. Luckily, all were not dead. One student had gone out. Um, I guess he went to the washroom or something like that. So then he came back. That's my guess. So he came back and Patanjali was delighted. He embraced him and he taught him the whole grammar. But the story doesn't end there. The boy, when he graduated, he had the most valuable grammar written in palm leaf manuscripts, the commentary, Patanjali's Mahabhashya, the great commentary. He was walking home to go back to his village or city and establish a grammar school, um, a Sanskrit grammar school, not the grammar school we, are, we have in the United States. Uh, and it was hot, so he fell asleep under a tree. And uh, uh, um, what, what would happen, but a goat which was grazing there by came along and he saw these bundles of palm leaves and started chewing on them. Luckily, the boy woke up, the young student, he woke up in time and he shooed away the goat. But alas, a part of the great commentary was lost. Uh, and till this date has not been recovered. That is called the Ajabhakshita Bhashya, the goat-eaten commentary. <laughs> so anyway, it's such a colorful and nice story that I wanted to tell you. But that's grammar. But remember... Uh, the grammar that is being mentioned here is Vedic grammar, not the later Sanskrit Paninian grammar. It's an even older form of grammar. That's, so that's why Vedic experts have to learn that grammar also. So that is Vyakaranam. Vyakaranam means grammar, but here it specifically means Vedic grammar. Then we have um, Riksha Kalpa Vyakaranam Niruktam. Um, the etymology of Vedic words, which is quite different from later Sanskrit. So how do you derive those words? What do they mean? A kind of etymology and a kind of dictionary also. Most famous being Yaskas Nirukta. 
Yaska was a Vedic authority who compiled these Vedic terms. So if you wanted to look it up and know the meanings of the terms, so this Nirukta is there. It's like a dictionary with etymology. Vyakaranam Niruktam Chando Jyotishamiti. Chanda, poetics, the particular meter in which these Vedic mantras are written. So each of them has a precise meter in which they were written. The number of lines, the number of uh, letters in each line and so on. Then uh, Jyotisha. Jyotisha survives this day, to this day very popular. Astro astrology. All over, uh, especially in India, it's very popular. And it's popular here also. But this was the grandfather of astrology. The Vedic Jyotisha astrology was concerned with the positions of the constellations and time. So uh, the Vedic rituals, these elaborate rituals, they had to be done at a particular time with particular conjunctions of the stars and planets. So they needed to know these things and to recommend, make recommendations for the particular rituals. So it is connected to Vedic rituals, connected to the fire ritual. Modern astrology is, uh, is a different thing. Though it, it borrows heavily from Vedic astro astrology, but modern astrology is basically predicting your future. That's why it's so popular. I want to know what's going to happen to me. That was not at all uh, looked upon favorably in Vedic times. Uh, nowadays, a lot of people believe in it. Probably there is something to it. But um, uh, that was not what was meant by astrology in those days. Uh, it was an aid to Vedic rituals. So anyway, so what, did, what do we have putting it all together? Uh, Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, Atharva Veda, the four Vedas, Shiksha, Kalpa, Vyakaranam, Niruktam, Chando, Jyotishamiti, the six auxiliary sciences. In, in English, they're translated as Vedangas, limbs of the Vedic uh, system of knowledge, which, you, which are necessary to understand and use the Vedas. Basically, what um, you know, Vedic scholars, all of what they would study in those days. Today, you have to extend it to all kinds of secular knowledge. All of that, he says, lower knowledge. And then what's the higher knowledge? That by which you know the imperishable. So that by which you know the effects, whatever is in this universe, lower knowledge. And you do know the effects, you know, science and art, humanity and all of that. And that by which you know the cause, the one cause which is appearing as all these effects, that is called higher knowledge. Now, one might have a little question here. You included the, all of the Vedas under lower knowledge. So this Upanishad is part of the Vedas. Upanishad is part of the Vedas. So is it under lower knowledge or not? Now, there are two answers to this. One is, when he includes all the Vedas under lower knowledge, he means the ritualistic part of the Vedas. The Upanishads, which teach us about Brahman, are excluded from that. So they, they are the higher knowledge. But that's only a preliminary answer. The more deeper answer is the Vedas are this collection of texts, Shabda Rashi, collection of words. All of that is lower knowledge, including the Upanishads. All of that is lower knowledge. But the knowledge born of the Upanishads, you know, the moment of enlightenment, Brahma Gyan, the flash, the breakthrough, that is the higher knowledge because that reveals Brahman. The text itself does not directly reveal Brahman. It helps us. It takes us that way. So Shankaracharya, in his commentary, he makes some interesting points. Uh, one point he says is, Upanishad Vedya Akshara Vishayam hi Vigyanam iha parabidyaiti pradhanyena vivakshitam. Now Upanishad Shabda Rashi. He's very clear here. Shankaracharya says here, what is meant by the higher knowledge in this mantra is, the, the realization of Brahman, enlightenment, that moment when you realize Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, that knowledge is the higher knowledge. And yes, the Upanishads help you to get that knowledge. And he says, that's what's prim pradhanyena, primarily meant by higher knowledge, not the texts itself. The texts, even the Upanishad texts are part of the lower knowledge. So they are considered as part of the Vedas. And all of the Vedas, in fact, everything is lower knowledge. However, those texts help us generate that higher knowledge. And that higher knowledge is that which lets you realize I am Brahman. So enlightenment, literally speaking, enlightenment is the higher knowledge. Or if you don't want to quibble, 
in general, you want to take a broad sweeping view of it. Then the ritualistic portion of the Vedas, all secular knowledge, all conventional religion, lower knowledge, and what the Upanishads are teaching us, higher knowledge, in a, in a general sense. Another point he makes is, is that ataparayaya tadaksharam um, This Sanskrit term adhigamyate means attain. That which helps us to attain. And then Shankaracharya makes an important observation here. In Vedanta, attainment and knowledge are the same. When you realize I am Brahman, that is the attainment of Brahman. Because you are already Brahman. There is nothing more to be attained here. The comment he makes is, um, Na para prapte avagama arthasya bhedo asti. Avidyaya apaya hi eva hi prapti. Um, so when you come to realization of the absolute there is no difference between attainment and realization the realization I am Brahman is the attainment of Brahman because you are already Brahman yeah. so the, in this case there is no difference between knowledge and realization where is the difference? there is a big difference when you come to the uh, uh, you know in the world um, or in the other parts of the Vedas in other parts of the Vedas if you have knowledge the, of a particular ritual do this ritual properly and there will be plenty of rainfall or you will go to heaven that's not enough to attain the, re, uh, the result plenty of rainfall or heaven you actually have to go forward and then perform those rituals and then wait to do it properly and then wait for the result however in the case of Brahma Vidya enlightenment the, Vedic, the Vedantic knowledge if you get that knowledge and you realize it that's the attainment that's it there's nothing to be performed or no waiting for, for an attainment later. You see the difference between the two, between rituals and enlightenment. Or in the world, um, to know that uh, Central Park is beautiful is one thing, and then you have to go and see it for yourself. That's another thing. Uh, but here, to know that you're Brahman is to attain Brahman. Now, so he's made a clear distinction between uh, higher knowledge, lower knowledge. Now we would like to know what the higher knowledge is because he has given us details about the lower knowledge. All of what we know, we get it. All of what I know or I can know is lower knowledge. Higher knowledge is that which makes me realize the akshara, which makes me attain or realize the akshara, the imperishable. But that's a new term. What is akshara? Please explain what... That's what I wanted to know. That student is eager to know what's that one thing by knowing which I know everything. So tell me that one thing. You, you called it by a new name, Akshara. Tell me what Akshara is. Sixth mantra. Notice how this, uh, this Upanishad gets down to business right away. If you compare it with uh, the Kata Upanishad, for example, it took forever. It's a beautiful story and I love the story and we all love the story, but at some times you, you wondered when would he... When would Yama, the Lord of Death, answer the questions <laughs> of, of Nachiketa? That took quite a while. Here, he straight away gets into the subject itself. The sixth mantra, he tells us what Akshara, ultimate reality, what is it? Yattadadreshya magrahya magotram avarnam achakshushrotram tadapani padam nityam vibhum sarvagatam susukshmam let me give you the translation from Swami Gambhiranji. So what is that ultimate reality? By the higher knowledge, we, the wise, realize everywhere that which cannot be perceived and grasped, which is without source, without any features, without eyes and ears, which has neither hands nor feet, which is eternal, multiformed, all-pervasive, extremely subtle, and undiminishing, and which is the source of all. All right, that's a lot. What does it mean? Let me explain each of these terms. What is he explaining? Ultimate reality, Brahman. The term he used was Akshara, literally meaning the imperishable. So what is that imperishable? First he says, Adreshyam. The Sanskrit term adrishyam just means adrishyam or invisible. Invisible. You, you cannot see it. Um, and then by extension, 
not just it's not an object to the eyes you cannot see it but you cannot hear it or smell it or taste it or touch it so none of the sense organs can objectify brahman and we know why it is the pure subject it is the pure consciousness itself that which objectifies the entire universe you cannot objectify it uh, by the senses so it's invisible then agrahyam um, you cannot grasp it by the motor organs, organs of action. What it means is, um, so can I reach Brahman maybe by going on a pilgrimage? I can go to um, you know, a holy place like Banaras or to the Himalayas. Can I go somewhere and reach it you know, by feet? Can I catch hold of it by the hands? Uh, can I um, you know, speak of it with my tongue? So with the organs of action, is it attainable? He says, no, it's not an object for the organs of action. So there is no way of knowing it through the senses. There is no way of attaining it through some action. Agotram, uh, it is without any source. So what it, what it means is that um, literally the word gotra is for any Hindu. It means lineage. Who are your forefathers? What is your source? So uh, Shankaracharya translates as anvaya mulam. That means, does it have a root, a source? We are the ornaments. Their source is gold. And the waves in the water, the source is water. Every, um, you know, all of our, our bodies, they're made of the five elements. There's a source there. It's rooted, based in something. This has no cause, no source. There's no higher or more fundamental reality than this. So it is um, agotram. It has not been produced from anything else. Everything emerges or appears in it, but it is not caused. It does not have a cause. Akshara or Brahman does not have a cause. Um, avarnam it literally means without any particular features, without any qualities, without any form, without any qualities which may distinguish it. In other words, nirgunam, without any attributes, attributeless. Achakshu Shrotram, without uh, eyes and ears, basically without, now uh, it, is, um, uh, it is not something that uh, has sense organs and nose through eyes and ears. Um, Tadaparni Padam, it does not have hands and feet. So it's not a sentient being which uses organs of action to walk around or grasp things. Basically what has been said here is, it is not the subject of knowledge, not the object of knowledge. It is not the subject, the doer of actions, not the object of actions. The subject of knowledge is uh, the one which, who, which has eyes and ears. The, with eyes and ears, you are the subject. You, eyes and ears mean the five senses uh, with instruments of knowledge. I, the consciousness associated with the senses, I know things. And the doer of actions, I, in association with um, hands and feet and, you know, with cars and instruments and all of these things in the scientific things, I am the doer of actions. And it says, it does not have the instruments of actions. It does not have the instruments of knowledge. So it's not a subject of knowledge, nor is it the subject of the doer of actions. And he has already denied that it's an object of knowledge. See, it can't be seen. It's invisible. It's not an object of knowledge. Is already denied that he is an object of action. By no action can you attain it. So subject, objecthood is denied of Brahman. It's not the subject of knowledge, nor the object of knowledge. It's not a knower through. It's not a seer or hearer or smeller or taster or toucher. It's not something that is seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched. It's not a something that, you know, uh, which is hands and feet, which grasps and walks around and does things. Nor is it something that can be attained through action by, you know, you can't grasp it, you can't walk to it, you can't do anything to attain it. So it's not a, the subject of action or the object of action. Therefore, neither subject nor object, beyond subject-object duality, it is non-dual. All right. Then all of this was neti neti, not this, not this. It's in, it cannot, um, you know, invisible, uh, uh, ungraspable, uh, without any source, and without any attribute. Um, without any sense organs, without any organs of action. Neti, neti, not this, not this. Now positive. Nityam. It's eternal. 
Um, being non-dual, there is no way of being destroyed, eternal in the sense of avinashi. It does not change and die like everything else in this universe. So it is um, eternal. Vibhum, uh, Shankaracharya will say that uh, vividham, vividham, brahmadi sthavarantam prani bheda bhavati. Vividham bhavati iti vibhu. It appears as, um, uh, it becomes many. Starting from Brahma, what did we read here? Brahma was the first of gods to be manifest. And then Brahma created the universe. So this entire universe, it appears as everything, as the gods, as the humans, as the demons, as animals and plants, as um, earth and stars and planets. And all of this is that non-dual Brahman. And look at the juxtaposition of these two terms, eternal and becomes many. Eternal means it's indestructible, beyond change, non-dual. If it's non-dual, how can it be many? You think about it. How can something which is non-dual without a second then become many? The only way it can do so if the many are appearances. Um, if the many are not distinct from the cause. How can water become 10,000 waves, the one water. Well, because those 10,000 waves are nothing but that one water. How can that same uh, one uh, lump of clay become so many pots and jars and so on? Well, because they are all nothing other than that lump of clay. They're literally that same material. Similarly, even when it is an extraordinary display of billions of entities, living and non-living, vast and small, all of it is one existence consciousness place, Brahman non-dual, not a second entity, countably not a second one apart from it. It's very easy to see when you um, think of the dream example in our dreams. So suppose I'm taking a nap, but I, I forget that I'm sleeping and I think I'm walking in Central Park and I see the beautiful blue sky and um, you know the uh, beautiful lake and the people and the plants and flowers and I am also there, I'm walking there and yet when I do wake up, I realize what do I realize about what I experienced I experienced I the unchanging I am the, I, I was that person lying on the bed and sleeping, I became all of that, became within quotes, you know I myself became Central Park and the sky there and the lake there and the flowers there and the people there. And even I, me, myself, I was there in the dream too. Both subject and object. I by myself became all of that. And, but I, did I really become, did the dreamer's mind become a park and sky and earth and stone and bricks and living beings? No, no, no. It appeared in those forms. So you are Nityam, you are undecaying, you have not changed. And at the same time, you became, you, the dreamer, became multiformed, vividam bhavati. You appeared in multiple forms to yourself. Not only that, you appeared as the subject and the object. Everything that you saw in the dream was you, the dreamer. Nothing other than you. And the one who was in the dream, walking around in Central Park and watching all those things, that also was you. The subject was also you. And another interesting thing. That which was seen in Central Park in the dream, did you actually see it through eyes and hear it through ears? No, your eyes were closed. You were dreaming here, here on, on the bed. Your ears were not hearing the bird song in Central Park. No, nothing. You're sleeping. So it's the mind by itself, without eyes, without ears, heard and saw everything in Central Park. Did you actually walk around in Central Park? No. It is the dreaming mind itself, without hands and legs, it walked around in Central Park. Do you see how it works? Exactly like that. It's not that pure consciousness or Brahman suddenly sprouts eyes and ears and then sees through the eyes and hears through the ears. Not that Brahman actually sprouts hands and feet and actually starts walking around and catching things with hands. No. It's all an appearance, sense organs, the subject and objects and actions. All of that is an appearance in one limitless consciousness. You are that limitless consciousness. And hence, uh, it is without eyes and ears. And yet it sees. It is without hands and feet. And yet it can act. 
but all those seeing and acting is within quotes. Sarvagatam Sushukshmam. Sarvagatam. Brahman is all pervading, like the sky. In your dream, when you're dreaming, walking around Central Park, were you not all pervading? Or were you only in one place walking around? No. You were the subject in one place in the dream, but the whole of the dream and all of it, you were there everywhere because it all appeared in you. So you pervaded everything. That means you gave the space for that entire appearance. So that unchangeable, undecaying reality, we'll see more of this next time, uh, which the dhira, the wise ones, those who are enlightened, paripashyanti, they see all the time. Not only in samadhi, not only reading in the Upanishads, in every action with eyes open and eyes closed, they are able to perceive. Perceive means discern this in every experience. Basically, you know, seeing the divinity everywhere, in, in with eyes closed and with eyes open everywhere, this one underlying reality. Just as you would be able to see gold in every golden ornament, the clay in every clay pot and jar. Exactly like that. All right. I'll have to stop here, but let me quickly see the comments. I'll take up this mantra again because Shankaracharya in his commentary makes many perceptive observations. So those will take a look at in this mantra. Sri Ram says, is it not possible that a realized master may know both the para and upper, upara, para and the upper, I think upara you mean. Ramana Maharshi was reported by devotees with different occupations, instant to record and cite all scriptures and esoteric facts. Yes, probably, probably. Uh, Vedanta says, the only one who can know everything in detail would be Ishwar or Bhagavan. But the enlightened one would certainly know that everything is Brahman. We would certainly know everything is Brahman. And the only thing is that accomplished yogis, masters, they have certain occult ways of knowing things in detail, which normally not available to most of us. But Advaita promises this much. You will know the reality of all things, which, which is Brahman. And that will liberate us. And that's enough. And then Amira says, as mentioned, a Ganeshji type of knowledge, higher knowledge can free you from all your problems if you know that everything is Brahman and you are that reality. Um, ancient wisdom, modern times, how might this truth benefit those in the teens, 20s, 30s who are still involved in the chaos from lower knowledge? Provide clarity on why this truth should appeal to this group of people to solve their everyday problems. Yes, as you have said, everyday problems like jealousy, competition, failure, relationship issues, identity crisis, if you can be introduced, if they can be introduced, how an understanding of this one, this underlying oneness and their own divine nature or spiritual nature can directly address their problems. How meditation can directly address the problem of distraction and unhappiness. How devotion, bhakti can directly ad uh, address the problem of, uh, you know, relationship issues and, you know, being frustrated in trying to seek love in the world outside. How the doctrine of the teaching of selfless work, of, of being of help to others, can directly give us satisfaction rather than being selfish. You have to appeal to um, the enlightened selfishness, you know, that how through this knowledge I can get benefit straight away. And not just this knowledge. Uh, associated with this knowledge are the yogic knowledge. There is, the, there is karma yoga, bhakti yoga. Raja Yoga, meditation, devotion, selfless uh, action, service, all of these are wonderful ideas. Um, young people have, an, have advantages, you know, and with all the disadvantages, the advantages are uh, people are uh, enthusiastic and, uh, and sharp and uh, idealistic. Very important is uh, you know, young people are very idealistic and if the highest ideals can be installed, uh, can be instilled at that age, it can be a great blessing for those young people and for society, for people, for the, the young people, their families, for the community and for society at large. I think a lot of young people are becoming interested because they see, they are sharp enough to see the value of this knowledge, that there's something deep and profound here. Um, Abhijit says, the great advancement of ancient Indian mathematics developed due to the need to understand astrology. Correct, correct. The Kerala School of Mathematics had very advanced. Um, true, true. 
So Abhijit is a, a pure mathematician and uh, he um, so he knows what he's talking about. Time, mathematics, timekeeping, mathematics, they were very precise things which were de developed. Uh, I remember when I became a brahmachari, I joined the order. Uh, I was talking to a senior monk in our ashram and I said, oh, I read in a book uh, we Indians did not have precise timekeeping and we learned it only when the British introduced railways and railway schedules. So we had uh, precise time. Uh, this concept came into use. And the Swami was very annoyed. He said, what do you mean? This, uh, this Vedic rituals, they were done down to very precise you know, hour and uh, the very instance in which this ritual had to be performed. That knowledge was of, of astrology, the time of, of astronomy, in fact, and the time of the day and the position of the stars and the sun and the moon and all of that was calculated to moments long before railways were introduced by the British, thousands of years before that. Sri says his non-duality naturally intuitive for some more than for others. It's not naturally intuitive for anybody. That's why it has to be taught. Duality is naturally intu intuitive. Non-duality is counterintuitive. But some can grasp it faster. Some can grasp it faster. It takes time. I, for example, like the idea of it uh, ever since I've, I, I remember as a kid also, I liked the idea of non-duality. I loved it. But I don't think I really understood any of it. Um, it took me years and years and so to get a little bit of clarity that I have now. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu